smart learning program for the residents. Today we have the topic on urological complications of renal transplant, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Rajiv TP, who is the professor and head of the department at Guwahati Medical College. And he was also the past uh, honorary secretary of the Urological Society of India. This topic is very important because practically also you would for institutions where transplant is being done, you would be handling these complications on a daily basis. And for the exam, it is going to be one of the stock questions for us to listen carefully to Dr. Rajiv TB so that you could um, do well in the exam for the theory and also this would be useful for your practicals. Uh, I would now invite Dr. Rajiv Sood to give his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, Dr. Keshav. Greetings from Indian School of Urology. Uh, today's topic uh, belongs to one subspecialty of urology, that is the transplant. And in transplant, you all know that uh, we are now uh, in the process of developing this uh, subspecialty as the part of uh, urological uh, learning, uh, teaching, and uh, very good programs have been uh, happening in the last uh, two years in this subspecialty. And now about Dr. Rajiv TP. Rajiv TP is an excellent teacher and uh, he has been the uh, secretary and also the uh, treasurer before that and in his secretaryship. The whole program of this uh, uh, resident learning program started during the COVID uh, period. And uh, one more thing that uh, his contribution was immense and his knowledge is immense we, that he is going to share. I'll invite all the residents to actively interact and participate in the symposia. Renal transplant uh, is now in the domain of urologist. We should all the residents should understand the DNB program is cannot be done uh, without uh, uh, transplant facility. As assessor, when we go, we cannot uh, approve a center if uh, renal transplant is not done. And uh, also um, in a national medical uh, commission also, and uh, the, since the time of NCI. Uh, we, if uh, renal transplant affiliation or the actual program is not going on, is not uh, approved by the for the teaching of national board or by teaching of MCI. And also, there is uh, uh, another thing that in theory, as well as uh, in the practical, you may get the questions on the, but for theory for the assessments and all, it is very important. It is a national program. It is a national program center. I think the more uh, about the law, legal positions and the complications and how to medical legal implications. These all in, are in the more and more domain of humanities. And therefore, this topic is to be uh, concentrated uh, very, very um, uh, concentration on this topic is very important for the residents and uh, for the departments also and I i'll invite all the faculty also to actively tell their residents to participate in the program dr uh, rajiv tp the eminent professor eminent uh, uh, um, office bearer of uh, urological society of india part of the he guided the indian school of urology also in this tenure and uh, actually the five years of uh, um, uh, this uh, Indian School of Urology, uh, which is going on, uh, he was uh, actively involved in all the five years. So I invite Dr. Uh, Rajiv TP. And before that, some good words, words about uh, Dr. Rajiv TP by Dr. Arun Chawla. Thank you, Professor Sood. Now I would invite Dr. Arun Chawla to introduce the speaker and moderate the session. Over to you, Dr. Arun. Uh, thank you, Dr. Keshe. Uh, it's indeed a great uh, privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Arjeev TP to all the viewers. Uh, Dr. Arjeev TP is currently head of department uh, uh, urology and renal transplant at Guwahati Medical College and Hospital. 
he did his uh, MCH in Geology from a prestigious institute of AIMS Delhi. And he backed the honors of having a, a gold medal during his uh, MCH uh, uh, training. A very experienced urologist with a very keen interest in endogeology. Excellent teacher and he has always been interested in renal transplant. And uh, that's how our today's resident teaching program on, on uh, renal transplant urological complications. Uh, more than 50 research paper in international journals in his name and many research papers in national journals. Um, he has tremendous organizational capabilities. He has been treasurer of uh, Urology Society of India and the youngest secretary of Urology Society of India. And uh, during his uh, COVID time, during the COVID times, uh, he has been instrumental in bringing many virtual academic programs under the ages of uh, USI. And also he has served in various posts of uh, high regards, like uh, he has been inspector of Medical Council of India uh, and other associations. Many honors and awards with credit, and he has been bestowed with the visiting professorship at the University of Minnesota, USA. And uh, today's uh, talk uh, by Dr. Rajiv T.P. Uh, on, on resident uh, um, online uh, learning program is on the complications which follow after renal transplant. And um, he has uh, uh, split the talks into various segments. Uh, on the various issues which uh, happens uh, in the immediate uh, delayed and the late period after the transplant. And the, the, the issues are so common that we, we uh, see them in day-to-day -day scenarios and probably will make you wiser in planning the management of uh, transplant postoperatively and also probably make you wiser in discussing these issues when you are uh, having a discussion with the your nephrologist colleagues uh, and those who are already in the in the field of transplant probably it will make uh, you much wiser and increase your proficiency also and uh, i'll uh, uh, with this verse i'll invite uh, dr rajiv tp for this class and uh, i request all the residents to uh, stay proactive please put your question in the chat box which will be taken uh, after his uh, class is over I request Saurav Reddy and Shruti Pandit to keep yourself unmuted and with video on so that if Dr. GFTP has to interact with you, uh, uh, he'll be uh, happy to um, uh, have a discussion with you. And those residents who wants to have uh, interaction during the course of his presentation, please put, put your name in the chat box. We'll keep you unmuted and your video on. Uh, over to you, sir, Dr. GFTP. Thank you, Arun, for your nice words. First of all, I would like to thank the Council of Urological Society of India and the Indian New School of Urology uh, for giving me the chance to present today's topic uh, of uh, urological complications in renal transplant. So let me share my screen. Can you see it's visible? Yes, sir. Absolutely fine. Thank you. Good evening, all the residents, both MCH and uh, uh, DNB trainees. This topic is of great importance as because these are more, more uh, urological complications which are commonly seen in the recipients post transplant. So a brief introduction that is renal transplant is the most cost-effective treatment for all end-stage renal disease because renal transplantation is the only modality which can improve the chances of survival as well as the quality of life in the patients who are having end-stage renal disease. But renal transplantation is associated with a variety or array of complications and these complications can increase the morbidity among the recipients as well as the cost of care. Majority of these complications in the transplant patients are related to the transplanted ureter or the ureterovesical anastomosis. The learning objectives are briefly evaluation and management of post-operative hematuria in these recipients. And, one, and knowing the utility of placing a urethral stent, when one should remove the stent, how to prevent, diagnose, and treat 
cases of retained and encrusted stents, once knowing the etiology, diagnosis, and uh, treatment of postoperative urine leak in the recipients, knowing the various etiological factors of postoperative urethral obstruction, how to diagnose and immediate and definitive treatment of urethral strictures in the recipients. Then postoperative VUR, whether it should always require anastomotic re revision or just observation is only what is required. What is a lymphocyte, when and how it should be treated. Then nephrodithiasis in the yellow graph, what are the indications and what are the modalities of treatment available. Lower urinary tract problems in recipients after transplantation, how to evaluate these patients and manage them. Then knowing the incidence and management of genital urinary malignancies in the recipients. First coming to the most common thing, hematuria. It can occur in the immediate post-operative period. It is usually related to the urethrovesicle anastomosis and it has been found that this is commonly found after Ledbetter type of anastomosis. It has been found that these hematuria in these patients usually resolves over several days and it rarely requires any irrigation or other active interventions. Suppose there can be, there can be persistent hematuria in some patients because this is usually following after a low graft biopsy when there is some suspicion of rejection in these patients we have to rule out uh, rejection and this hematuria are due to formation of av collecting system fistula and these are diagnosed on suspicion by duplex ultrasound and if required one can confirm this by doing an mr in geography usually it resolves spontaneously and in majority of the cases to the tune of 70 percent cases these hematuria resolve spontaneously on conservative protocol. But those cases which are refractory, one may require highly selective embolization. Now, there are cases of asymptomatic microscopic hematuria in the recipients. And these cases of asymptomatic microscopic hematuria, usually you follow evaluation, you should follow the usual UA guidelines. Most commonly, one should suspect a BK virus infection, and this is suspected on viral cystopathic changes on cytology when you have a viral cystopathic changes. And one can further confirm it by during urine titers for BK viruses. Now, urethral stent, usually in earlier days, majority of the cases, urethral stents have been placed. And now we'll come to what is the utility of plague uh, play, stent placement and timing for removal. Its utility is mainly to reduce the incidence of urethral leak as well as the incidence of post-operative urethral stricture. But stent is associated, stenting is associated with an intrinsic risk of bacterial colonization. And it is found that 25% there can be colonization regardless of the indwelling time, how long you keep the stent. And suppose there is a severe colonization and the subsequent UTI which follows can lead to graft rejection, which may ultimately may land in graft failure. So this should not be taken lightly. So one has to tackle this situation adequately and in a very intensive manner. So the graft is not rejected and the patient ultimately lands with graft failure. So one should consider individualized stent removal after three weeks post-transplantation. But at the same time, I will stay properly done anastomosis. Stent placement may not be mandatory in all cases. So you can <coughs> uh, avoid the complications or morbidities associated with placement of stent. So there are two ways. Some people go for early stent removal usually before, uh, before three weeks, but ideally do it by 15 days. This is mainly done to reduce the incidence of UTI without a discernible effect on urine leak or stenosis. So one has to go for a case by case approach. This should be based on the surgeon's satisfaction with the anastomosis. 
or if there are patients who have other comorbid factors like diabetes mellitus, mellitus transplant revision is done, presence of urine leak, then in those cases, stent placement may be ideal. So now coming to the retained stent. Retained stent can be due to technical error, for example, while taking the sutures, anastomotic suture, suture catching the stent, or it can be a forgotten stent and the resultant encrustations. In case of technical error, the options can be leave the stent until the suture dissolves, or if it is required, if there is suture is not dissolving in time, taking time, one can go for endoscopic stitch transection. Now, coming to encrusted stent, it has been found that the incidence is to the tune of 0 to 5.7 percent. Rarely they manifest, encrusted stent manifest the classical symptoms of retained stent. This is basically because of the renal graft, allograft denervation. So the use classical symptoms may not be present in these patients. So non-compliant patients may forget it and ultimately late, the very latest stage they can come with encrusted stent. So presentations are usually in the form of progressive decline in the renal function status. They can be declining the urine output, recurrent episodes of UTI. So rarely poorly characterized ache over the allograft may be present. This is usually due to the associated peritoneal irritation. So this is the various ways in which patients, uh, recipients with encrusted stent may present to you. Now prevention, one has to follow the classical example of this recent Swiss cheese model of system, because this occurs due to a chain of errors like there is lack of proper documentation regarding the stent insertion. Next can be a poor team communication because whoever is involved, there is some misunderstanding and there is no appropriate communication between one and the other. Next is the patient is not counseled properly, inadequate patient counseling. And the next is a totally non-compliant patient. Now, how to ensure timely removal? One can go for a proper, a proper maintenance of logbooks. Or now there are 10 cards which has been given, a copy is maintained with you. Another is a computerized track, tracking registry, web-based stent registry, or nowadays even smartphones has also been employed, employed for communicating in advance to the recipient so that they come on time for the removal of the catheter. But till date, none of these have been shown to be completely uh, authentic. Now, diagnosed usually by CT scan, which can assess the burden of encrustation as well as the distribution of the encrustation, whether it is in its entirety, whether it is in the lower end, whether there is a big stone formation and other details can be given by CT scan. So management first step, one should go for a urinary diversion, usually in the form of nephrost placement of a nephrostomy tube. But later on, one has to advocate definitive treatment. If the stent administration burden is not too much, one can go for a session of shockwave lithotripsy for dusting off the encrustations, then removing the stent endoscopically. Sometimes this may not be feasible, then one may have to do a retrograde RIRS or a PCNL may be required. Now coming to the next common complications, which of complication which is found in the recipient is urinary leak. It is one of the earliest urological complications. Incidence is 1.2 to 8.9%. And what is the cause of this urine leak? The main cause is supposed to be compromised blood supply to the distal ureter. This happens during the procurement and because of the compromised blood supply to the distal ureter, they, this may lead to ureteral ischemia and ultimately necrosis of the distal ureter. This is very commonly found in those donors, advanced donor, or in those donors, extended criteria donors, where the allograft is having multiple arteries and 
sometimes by mistake failure to reimplant a lower pol polar artery all these can result in uh, ureteral ischemia and necrosis now one should remember about this picture this is known as the golden triangle so once you do a donor nephrectomy or even in the cadaver one should one is going for a donor this kidney procurement this triangle is very important this is known as the golden triangle bounded boundary is lower pole of of kidney on the left junction between renal vein and ivc on the right and the gonadal vein so one should be very careful and maintain the structures here so that you are not compromising with the vascular supply to the pelvis and the, the length of the ureter which you are going to transplant uh, anastomose into the bladder so additional causes of urine leak can be a very excessively long ureter premature removal of the ureter drainage technical problems like suture dehiscence ureter twisting or kinking then when there is catheter blockage and the patient goes into acute retention this can be a cause for the urine leakage sometimes there can be over dissection there can be necrosis of the renal parenchyma post transplant then parenchymal perforation during double j double j stent placement now how to diagnose them these patients with urine leak usually present with high have a high output from the drain there will be decrease in urine output the serum creatinine may be elevated and one may find that following the removal of the drain there will be fluid leak from the wound wound dehiscence can be there patients may present with scrotal swelling and there can be sometimes pelvic or abdominal pain now when you do an ultrasound or ncct this can diagnose the fluid collection and the con confirmation is basically by doing analysis of the fluid which is aspirated on ultrasound on ct or taking the fluid from the drain or wound discharge if the fluid in the urine then the creatinine level will be much higher than that of the serum creatinine then treatment primary goal in these cases of urine leakage is going for a diversion why you divert the urine because this will improve the graft function and another factor will be this can diversion can ameliorate the patient's general status how you achieve this diversion it can be in the form of a simple foley's catheter drainage or if not uh, sufficient then one can put in a pcn tube placing a pcn tube has lot of additional advantages like it will facilitate performing an anti grade nephrostogram and it will guess give an access for anti grade stent placement as well if urinoma is the cause for ureteral obstruction of urinoma causes the ureteral obstruction or if there is evidence of infection then percutaneous drainage is mandatory treatment of these cases may be in the form of endourologic management so one to two weekly contrast studies can be done diligent follow up is mandatory because these cases have a high risk of development of ureteral stenosis and success rate of endourologic management has been reported to the tune of 36 to 87% in a follow up varying up to 35 months exploration if the endourologic management is not sufficient or is not um, preventing this thing then one has to go for exploration early exploration and reconstructive surgery is done if there is a proximal large leak or there is persistent leakage despite adequate drainage then there is no way out one has to go for immediate exploration and do the reconstruction what are the rationale for early surgical intervention this includes low success rate of conservative management lack of intra abdominal addition 
if, if you go for an early intervention than a late intervention, there will be minimal degree of post-operative fibrosis if you intervene early, and there is decreased risk of subsequent development of urethral stenosis. Now, options are adequate blood supply to urethral remnant, that is a tension-free urethral neocystostomy. So if there is adequate blood supply to whatever urethral remnant is there, one can go in for a tension-free urethral neocystostomy. But if you find that there is a compromise in the blood supply to the uh, lower ureter, then ureteroureteral anastomosis can be done using the patient's native ipsilateral ureter. Or if there is a long length of the ureter is gone, one may have to go for a bladder flap or sometimes a pylovesicostomy may be indicated. Now coming to ureteral obstruction, this is divided into early and late. Early means which occurs before three months. And these early ureteral obstruction are due to technical error during the ureteroneocystostomy. It can be because of a foregone ureteral stent. It can be due to anastomotic edema, redundant ureter, or sometimes can be because of the extrinsic compression, compression due to a large lymphocyte hematoma or abscess. Late ureteral obstruction, that is those occurring beyond four, three months, these are because of stone formations, development of ureteral strictures, again because of lymphocyte. Then again, it can be because of fibrosis, which is related to immuno suppressant medications. Now, ureteral stricture is the most common cause of ureteral obstruction in those patients beyond three months post-transplantation. And it has been found in one to nine percent of patients. Causes again, ischemia is the most common cause. Urine leakage resulting or sometimes delayed management can lead to ureteral stricture formation. Ureteral stricture also can be as a component of graft rejection phenomena. Chronic infections can also result in ureteral stricture formation. And again, rarely can be because of BK virus and CMV infections. Diagnosis, it should be suspected when there is deterioration of renal function is seen without hydronephrosis of the transplant kidney. Hydronephrosis is less than expected. This is because of the fact that the system is not able to expand because of the surrounding fibrosis. Anti-grade nephrostogram or we take a test will establish the diagnosis. This is a case of uh, proximal ureteral stricture on an anti-grade nephrostogram. This will reveal hydronephrosis in the yellow graft. There is no visualization of the lower ureter. How to treat them? Priority is again decompression. Options available with you are doing a nephrostomy. One can go for a nephroureteral stent, anti-grade stenting or retrograde stenting. Definitive management, it can be endoscopic like placement of double J stenting, ureteral balloon dilatation can be done, or one can also try endoureterotomy using a cold knife or holmium laser if available. Open surgical management is the most effective one. Basically it is allograft ureteric reimplantation. As I have already cited earlier, one may have to go for a ureteroureteral anastomosis using the ipsilateral native ureter. If required, one has to use bori flap. Sometimes appendix or allium interposition may be required and pylovesicostomy. Nowadays, um, robot assisted laparoscopic approach is being done for this instead of the open surgical management. And this should be done only by people who are expert in robot assisted laparoscopic surgery. Now coming to vesico ureteral reflex. This is another complication which is seen in the recipient. It is this VUR is independent of any type of astomotic technique. 
and incidence is on an MCU, it is seen in 50 to 86 percent of cases. But clinically significant or symptomatic cases will be less than 1 percent. So what is the implication of VUR in a recipient? Because this, those patients who are having significant or symptomatic VUR may have higher incidence of hypertension or urosepsis in a period of five years. Causes are again because of the technical error during the performance of urethroneosystostomy, or it can be because of the pending bladder outlet obstruction, or it can be because of a high pressure urine storage, because of detrusor overactivity or impaired bladder compliance. So how will you diagnose? Patient may present to you with recurrent UTI. When you do a VCUG, it will show VUR. And such cases, you have to do a comprehensive workout, basically to rule out the presence of bladder outlet obstruction or high pressure urine storage. How to treat these cases? One has to focus mainly on the underlying cause for the VUR. If it is because of a high pressure urine storage or bladder outlet obstruction, you have to adequately treat this condition. But usually reflex needs to be addressed only very, very rarely. So options for symptomatic VUR are, if it is a low grade VUR, that is grade one and two, one can go in for an endoscopic submucosal injection of Teflon. But in those cases of a high grade VUR or in those cases of failed endoscopic management, an anastomotic revision may be required, that is ureteral implant or ureteral implantation into the ipsilateral native ureter. Lymphocyte. Lymphocyte is a pseudocyst containing lymph content and it is usually covered by a hard fibrous capsule around the graft. Radiologically, it is found in 0.6 to 33% of the recipients but symptomatic only in 0.03 to 26%. And lymphocyte develops within a period of six, week, six months and peak incidence is seen around six weeks post-transplant. It has got a variety of array of etiological factors. It has been found thought to be due to extensive dissection of lymphatics around the iliac vessels of the recipient renal vessels of donor either during organ procurement surgery or during back table preparation. And it has got a high incidence among those obese recipients. Again, recipient age is a factor at one stage. And again, it has been said that the duration of dialysis, hemodialysis, pre-transplant is also a factor for the development of lymphocyte. Warm ischemia time has again a role here. Use of prophylactic low molecular weight parent. Those patients who have delayed graft function has got a high incidence of development of lymphocyte. Those cases of acute rejection, redo transplant, and even use of mTOR inhibitors are also associated with uh, incidence of development of lymphocyte. Presentations, majority of these lymphocytes are asymptomatic, but large lymphocytes can present with an array of problems. It can present with unilateral lower limb edema. There can be sudden deterioration of the graft function. Then again, the symptoms may be related to extrinsic bladder compression by a large lymphocyte. Patient may present with fever off and on and some patients may present with deep vein thrombosis. It is due to the compression on the external iliac vein. How to diagnose them? The fluid around the graft is confirmed by doing an ultrasound or by doing a CT scan. Then one should go for the biochemical and microbiological analysis of the aspirated fluid in order to differentiate it from urinoma seroma or an abscess. Samples are usually obtained directly from the drain and by or by doing an ultrasound or CT guided 
fine needle aspiration. Majority are asymptomatic, so no treatment is required because these lymphocytes tend to resolve spontaneously. For those lymphocytes which are quite symptomatic, that is incidence is less than 15%, one may try aspiration with or without sclerotherapy. Sometimes a placement of a drain may be sufficient, but if there are large lymphocytes, one should not delay in decortication, and this may be by laparoscopy or open decortication with a peritoneal window. Open drainage is done in those patients who have wound complications or those patients where it has been found there is a lymphocyte adjacent to vital renal structures. It is better to go for open drainage. Now coming to nephrolithiasis, the incidence of nephrolithiasis is very low. It is to the tune of 1%. And it has been found that main time to stone onset is 28 plus, plus minus 22 months. The stones are commonly calcium-based stones, followed by struvite stones, followed by uric acid stones. And factors which are responsible for the development stones in transplant recipients are basically secondary hyperparathyroidism, recurrent UTIs, then it may be because of metabolic abnormalities like hypercalciuria, hyperuricosuria, hypercitrituria, or hyperoxaluria. Even it can be due to the deleterious effect of immunosuppressive medications because cyclosporin can result in chronic hyperuricemia. Calcineurin inhibitors can lead to hyperoxaluria and hypocitrituria. So these are the various factors which causes stone in transplant recipients. How to treat them? It is basically following the algorithm of stone management in the native kidneys. If the patient is asymptomatic and the stone size is less than four mm, basically observation and with serial ultrasonogram and serum creatinine assessment will suffix. But those stones which are found very active, that is growing on um, serial examination, or those become symptomatic, one have to do some um, modalities, either in the form of shockwave lithotripsy, RIRS, PCNL, or combination therapy, depending upon the location and the size of the stone. Follow-up is very crucial in these patients because patients develop silent hydronephrosis after ureteral instrumentations and comprehensive metabolic screening to identify and treat the underlying metabolic abnormalities of paramount importance. Lower urinary tract complications are also found in uh, transplant recipients because some of the transplant recipients are in the older age group. So voiding dysfunctions are common after transplant. So oliguria before transplant, that is the low urine volume may conceal a pre-existing bladder outlet obstruction or incontinence. So voiding dysfunction are basically because of three factors which act intricately. One is a small bladder capacity that is less than 300 ml, pre-existing anatomic abnormalities, and it also can be because of the direct effect of immunosuppression on bladder function by decreasing the bladder capacity. So evaluation is by taking a detailed history, both urologic and neurologic disorders, and previous urological surgeries. One should do a detailed urologic and gynecological physiologic physical examination and symptom assessment using these standardized questionnaires. Further evaluation or testing is on an individualized basis. And these include a urophlometry, urine dynamic, dynamic and cystoscopy. Small bladder after transplant. Bladder capacity in an anuric patient recipient 
grow gradually to reach the normal capacity after transplantation because all the transplant recipients are inuric they are on a regular hemodialysis and they have a small bladder but post transplant the bladder capacity will gradually increase to reach a normal status efforts to increase the bladder capacity before transplantation by various bladder rehabilitation or surgical augmentation are not at all indicated are quite unnecessary so what are the indications of treatment in these patients one is an insufficient bladder capacity when there is evidence of high storage pressure or when there is lutz which is causing significant botheration so what are the modalities advocated you can give anticholinergics sometimes not responsive to anticholinergic can go for botox injection very rarely bladder augmentation or allele conduit urinary diversion may be required now benign prostatic hyperplasia more common in elderly transplant recipients three year incidence has been found to the tune of 9.7% it is a very challenging thing to detect this in enuric patients and these patients enuric patients with bph has increased risk of uti and an increased chance of graft loss so you should consider all the precautionary measures if the preoperative evaluation or intraoperative findings suggest the patient is having significant degree of bph one should immediately start alpha blockers and if constipation is there treat constipation before removing the foley's catheter now regarding trp and follow up one should avoid this as far as possible before transplantation as the patient is still enuric or oliguric and there is every risk of development of bladder neck contracture or urethral stricture due to the lack of urine so in the first two weeks post transplant and the presence of a urethral stent one should not do it because there is every chance of increased sepsis and mortality so trp and holup if indicated is safe and effective if you perform at least 4 weeks later 4 weeks post transplant now coming to urinary incontinence urinary incontinence quite prevalent among the female recipients to the tune about 25% and diagnosis and treatment of stress incontinence in transplant patients are similar to non transplant patients now coming to genito urinary malignancies the commonest renal cell carcinoma the three cancers which are quite commonly found one is renal cell carcinoma one is prostate cancer and other is bladder cancer renal cancer cell cancer incidence is higher than in general population rcc represents 4.6% of post transplant cancers whereas it is 3% in the general population mostly it develops in the native kidneys and only 10% develop in the graft kidneys so this is a ct showing a small renal mass which is both exoendophytic in the a transplant kidney mean time to develop a de novo tumor in the graft is 30 31 months it has been found that most of these tumors are low grade firm firm and grade 1 and 2 and papillary rcc is found in 56% of kidney graft tumors and of the non papillary tumors 65% are low grade and treatment of these um, renal tumors are same as in general population so this is an algorithm how to follow them kidney transplant with rcc if rcc is in the native kidney and short life expectancy and small tumor size less than 4 cm one can go for active surveillance cryotherapy or radio frequency if the life expectancy is more then one can go for radical nephrectomy if it's a de novo rcc in the graft and the patient short life expectancy again active surveillance cryotherapy or radio frequency therapy if the life expectancy is more partial nephrectomy multiple partial nephrectomies 
or one can go combination modalities can be advocated. After allograft nephrectomy for metastatic RCC originating from the graft, one should always say that one should stop immunosuppression because this will stopping immunosuppression will help the resistance immune system to recover. And this recovery can reject the donor associated cancer cells. Screening for RCC in recipients not recommended for all native kidneys post transplantation, but screening is recommended those people with those recipients who are high risk recipients. For example, those who had a previous history of RCC, who have the history of analgesic nephropathy, history of tuberous sclerosis, or known acquired cystic diseases. So in these recipients, one should go for a very strict screening protocol. Now coming to prostate cancer, incidence of prostate cancer is similar to that in general population, and one should follow the same screening guidelines as in general population. Management is a challenge because of the fact that the anatomic proximity of the graft kidney to the surgical or radiation field, because this anatomic proximity of the graft kidney to the radiation field can cause risk of direct or indirect injury. Immunosuppressive medications patient, uh, putting, will put the patients at increased risk of infection, the lymphocyte, impaired wound handling and wound complications. Majority who underwent had organ confined disease with Gleason score less than six uh, and the modalities are incorporated. Our fellow. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, please unmute yourself. Motorola me? One Fusion, yeah. Uh, there's a background noise from your end. Yeah, <laughs> please unmute yourself. Yeah, over to you, sir. Over. So majority who have uh, in the literature reported to have undergone treatment for cancer prostate organ confined diseases with Gleason score less than six modalities is surgical extirpation, radiation, or one can go for active surveillance. Now coming to bladder cancer, significantly increased risk compared to, with the general population. It is aggressive type and tends to be associated with a very high recurrence rate, progression and metastasis. Active surveillance regimen is necessary. And mean time between transplantation and bladder cancer diagnosis is 2.86 years. Managing kidney transplant recipients is challenging. Why? Because of the fact that they are on immune suppression and they have got a high overall comorbidity. Selected patients with high risk non muscle invasive or non muscle invasive bladder cancer are managed with intravesical BCG. But those in those with muscle invasive bladder cancer, the options available are chemo radiotherapy or if required radical cystoprostectomy and urinary diversion but only the caution is one should take adequate care to avoid injury to the graft vessels or blood supply to the ureter now points to remember renal transplant recipients are at risk of multiple urological complications in most instances, management of this issue mirrors the management in the general population, but some special consideration. Diligence in rec recognition and treatment of these issues by the urologist is paramount to ensure optimal survival of the graft and patient. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reeves Johnson. A very, very compact presentation. I think um, you have covered almost the issues related to uh, the urine collections, uh, the strictures, their management, uh, the UTIs, the issues related to stent, uh, the uh, very important issue of lymphocele, and um, in the end, the malignancies of different organs, which can happen as a delayed complication.
um, um, there are not many questions, uh, but uh, the way you have covered, I think uh, all agents would have become much wiser. Um, uh, uh, the issues have been addressed very simply and very uh, to the point. And uh, I'll just take a few questions which have come. One is from our member, uh, Dr. Lakshman Prabhu. Um, he has appreciated your lecture and asked one question. Uh, are there any specific indications of uh, lead better polypeno type of reimplantation in renal transplant surgery? But, there is no special um, indication for lead better polypeno technique these days, but uh, earlier days it was done lead better. But now each and every transplant surgeons go in for a simple um, drop in technique that is the leech trigger because VR is not, not a concern in the transplant. Uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Shruti Pandit. Uh, in a patient with rejection, is there any role of keeping stent for a longer period? No, stent does no. The basic idea is to keep this, remove the stent as early as possible because the stent related uh, complications can indirectly again lead to infection, graft rejection, and graft failure. So the, you should keep the stent for the minimum period that is required. And the basic idea of the keeping the stent is to prevent urinary leakage in the initial stages if you are doubtful of your anastomosis. Or, especially these as I've cited earlier, stents are mainly based in those patients who are uh, extended criteria donors, those who are in the extremes of ages. In those patients only, uh, it is mandatory to keep the stent, but in, even then, early stent removal, that is ideally you can very well remove after 15 days. So this early removal will increase, but there is no nothing that um, in graft rejection, if you keep the stent, it will be. Um, this is one question from Dr. Ashwini. I think it looks like uh, from his uh, practical experience, he has asked, if there is a asymptomatic direct anguinal hernia, uh, which is containing a transplant ureter and is reducible. Should it be intervened surgically or we should wait? Uh, one can wait and see as far as possible because um, early intervention, if it is not required adequately, may lead to a lot of complications. But if um, it is entangling and if there is a reduction in the urine output and there are certain obstructive symptoms, it is better to tackle as early as possible. Um, Dr. Saurav Reddy wants to ask, why is the urine output so high immediately after a transplant? This is because of the post-obstructive diuresis, especially if you know because the body is full of nitrogenous waste. But when the kidney starts functioning, kidney is a filter, it starts filtering all the waste. So this nitrogenous waste again induces diuresis. This is as in all cases of post-obstructive diuresis. I think from your slide, you have mentioned that the RCC is more common in native kidneys uh, than the graft. So Ashwini wants to ask uh, if the recipient has ESRD and multiple acquired uh, renal cyst, should we do uh, bilateral native kidney nephrectomy to avoid RCC in the post period? See, uh, bilateral native kidney nephrectomy, uh, sorry, native kidney nephrectomy is done only in those cases of APKD, which um, um, it occupies a large space and uh, transplanting a kidney in the thing is very difficult. Otherwise, native kidney transplant uh, nephrectomy is not indicated. Only main indication is when it is huge in size, there is reduction in the less space available. So one has to go for um, native nephrectomy. Dr. Amit Kumar wants to ask you that what is the minimum period to keep the stent after transplant? I told you, 15 days. Yeah. I think it was covered very nicely, This uh, the stent issues, all issues were covered very nicely. Dr. Srinivas wants to ask, it's better to uh, routinely re-implant to native ureter to avoid ureter complications? If the uh, uh, supply to the end of the ureter is adequate enough, and if there is, you can re-anastomose it without any tension, then anastomoting into the bladder directly is the first option. If there is significant amount of ischemia, shortening of the length, then you can anastomose to the 
urea, this uh, trans, urea donor ureter to the ipsilateral native ureter? Uh, I think that was all from the chat box. Uh, I think one more question has come from Dr. Ashwini. The uh, ureteric picture related clinical scenario will have hydronephrosis. The slide had with hydronephrosis and you have mentioned without, I, I have not uh, understood the question. Ashwini, if you can unmute yourself and you can ask Dr. RGPP the question. Dr. Ashwini? And Dr. Arjeev, yes, can sir. you have a look at this chat box? Last question. The thing is that his question, maybe I have cited that um, even if there is an obstruction, there will not be significant amount of hydronephrosis. So you may miss this finding of hydronephrosis. Uh, this is the usual yes, scene of, um, thing because number of the space restriction and other things, you will not get the same degree of hydronephrosis as in the usual cases. That is what I mean to mention. I think, uh, Dr. Ashwini, you will be... Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shruti has asked one more question. If the recipient has VUR, she has not mentioned the grade, will we still do the same Lich-Gregor anastomosis, lich gregor recurrent implantation? So the management in the case of uh, VUR is dependent because most of the VUR um, need not require any treatment. So I have said in my slides that uh, only those patients who are significant um, and symptomatic clinical, see the symptomatic VR, which is found in the tune of less than 1%, they need treatment. So first, uh, what treatment is given as in all cases, we give for um, uh, Teflon injections and other things and see that the VUR results, especially in grade one and two. But if there's severe degree of um, VUR and they are symptomatic, then yes, uh, then revision is required, re-implantation. Yeah, uh, that was the end of all the questions from the chat box. Um, overall, a very, very a nice presentation. I think the all the slides have so many uh, uh, excellent messages. Uh, uh, I think every slide was, uh, what you can say, uh, uh, carrying so much of uh, information and material. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ajeev, for an excellent presentation. And um, uh, Dr. Ajeev Sud, are you there for the closing remarks? Dr. Sud? Dr. Ajeev? Hello? I, I think just one minute. I think he's on the on the phone. Let me just. Uh... Um, I think if somebody has any question, please unmute yourself and you can ask Dr. Ajeev. I'm just trying to uh, just uh, contact Dr. Ajeev Sudh. He's busy in the other call. Just give me one minute, sir. I heard there was a question like if there is a patient um, uh, gets COVID during the immediate uh, transplant period, any special precautionary measures are speaking? Yes, uh, because uh, these patients are already on immunosuppression. And uh, if the patient gets COVID, they need, um, number one, they should be uh, managed in an ICU setup with uh, very diligently and very carefully maintaining all the protocol. And these patients will be a very high risk patients High, goes into a very high risk COVID patients and uh, they need special attention and round the clock management in ICU. It's eight o'clock.
Dr. Ajeev, he is busy in the other call. I'm just trying to... Okay. In uh, brief, I have to tell the residents that uh, these are the common complications which one should be aware of uh, in transplant recipients. Because in the initial periods, one will um, face the complications like urinary leakage. Next thing is the development of lymphocyl, then infection, stent related problems. Because some of the patients, however, uh, you inform them to return for the checkup. They, you'll see that they come to you after six months, nine months, when they have some problem. Uh, so there are various uh, methods followed to maintain this stent registry, but still none of them are foolproof till date. Uh, so stent, leakage, lymphocyl are quite common uh, complications which you will incur in the initial um, years of transplant surgery. But when years pass by, when we become wiser and wiser, uh, so the incidence of these complications will come gradually, will come down. Because um, all these things are based on, again, the donor nephrectomy, because one should be very careful about the golden triangle, which I have already highlighted in my slide. Because this is a very precious thing. One should not ignore this area because any compromise in area uh, will land up with um, urethral ischemia and necrosis. Then it will ultimately lead to urinary leakage, obstruction, stricture formation, and other things. Um, so this is very important in the initial stages. So one should be very careful regarding this golden triangle. I think um, Dr. Ajeev Sud is, uh, uh, he was busy on the phone. Dr. Ajeev, we have finished uh, a, a, what you can say, an excellent lecture from uh, Dr. Ajeev TP covering all the issues. Um, very, very common issues and uh, put it in a very simple form. Um, uh, I just hand over to you now for the closing remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Arun. Uh, as usual, uh, it was expected actually that Dr. Uh, Rajiv TP will make uh, this uh, complicated subject very simple. And it, that is what is required for the residents, uh, resident uh, training. And uh, I think uh, it will generate a lot of interest also in transplant, which is now integral part of uh, uh, urology. It is no more that general surgeons will be doing as Dr. Rajiv has. Uh, very aptly uh, explained that how the urologist is going to tackle all the complications and many of the situations, I am sure that uh, everybody will uh, um, appreciate that only urologists can um, uh, handle. And uh, with this uh, transplant, renal transplant is back in the folds of urology. And this subspecialty will grow with the able leadership of uh, Arun Yu and uh, also Rajiv TP in the coming years. We are very happy that uh, Indian School of Urology is doing wonderfully um, in coordinating all the programs, but the teachers uh, like Rajiv TP are to be credited for the excellence which has been bestowed on such programs. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajiv TP, and also all the uh, listeners, uh, residents, uh, the USI office, everybody is to be uh, thanked at this stage. And we march ahead with our Indian School of Urology programs. Thank you very much. Good night for, for now. You, sir. Thank, thank you, you sir. very much. Thank you. Long, uh, long thank you, Dr. Ajit. Uh, Dr. Keshav Murthy has conveyed his thanks. He has still not reached home. He is still driving. He has also conveyed his thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks a okay. lot. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.